Okay, good morning, everyone. So we are, we are running a little bit behind schedule, so I'm warning you that I will break in your coffee break <laughs> because I want to give the presenters that we'll have in this, uh, the next hour uh, as much time to share their views and, and the work that they've done and allow for some, some interaction. Um, I want to start by, of course, thanking the organizers, not only for putting together an excellent conference program and the very nice hospitality that we have received uh, uh, in the past day and also later today, uh, but also to allow me to chair this, uh, this uh, next hour, because this next hour promises to be a very exciting uh, hour. And it will be exciting for three reasons. Uh, the first reason is, I'm not sure if you've looked in the program, but the next hour will not be a session, it will not be a round table, it will, luckily for you, not be a keynote speech, it will be a future forward. So this is, for me, the first that I'm allowed to moderate a future forward. I'm not exactly sure what we will end up with, but it promises to be very exciting. The second reason why it is very exciting is because this Future Forward brings together the three coolest words that we have at the moment in this conference. We have artificial intelligence, we have big data, and we have official statistics. So this must be extremely exciting. And the third reason why it will be a very interesting session is because we have three very nice presentations to inspire us about the combination of these three words. We have Eurostat, OECD, and IMF talking us through these various aspects uh, of our work uh, and to see how our future will actually look like. So I'm really looking forward to the presenters. I will not take more time than necessary. So I want to start by asking Jean-Marc Musseux to take the floor. Jean-Marc is from Eurostat and he's not a statistician. He's an enterprise architect. And in my organization, when uh, uh, we go to talk with our enterprise architect, it is uh, mostly uh, uh, when we need to create order in chaos, in digital matters. So I'm very pleased that you are here uh, with us, uh, Jean-Marc, to tell us about the potential of generative AI in official statistics. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fabienne. And I like very much your, your understanding of enterprise architecture, <laughs> bringing order into chaos. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm very much grateful to the organizer to have asked me to be presented in front of you, being a kind of outlier today, um, and to present this interesting topic and challenging topic. So exploring the potential, actually, the, more the challenge and the opportunities of generative AI uh, in official statistics. So as you said, Fabian, I'm an enterprise architect, so I'm not a data scientist. Uh, I'm not a statistician, I could be. Uh, I was a methodologist, but I learned to speak IT, I learned to speak to methodologists and to business who are uh, collecting the data. And in this function, I need to have a underst broad understanding or sometimes deep understanding or good understanding of uh, different topics like artificial intelligence and, and making sense of it. And that's the sense of my message today. It's try to convey what I understand there, not being a specialist. Uh, and, uh, and would be happy if you get this sense. It could be inspiring to you. Uh, as usual, this, my view does not represent the view of Eurostat, neither the view of European Commission, so it's uh, important to say. Uh, I will start with uh, first, uh, what is the outline of my presentation? I will start with acknowledgement, actually. Uh, much of the presentation and the paper will uh, build on two pillars. The first pillar is uh, really the work that has been undertaken by a group of international experts brought together by the UNEC HLG MOS, a uh, high-level group on modernization of official statistics. And this group has been for several months, July last year until December, reflecting and making sense of generative AI. And I was part of this group, uh, hopefully, uh, modestly. And, uh, and this group released a, a white paper on generative AI. And this is really my s main source of inspiration. Of course, the other pillar is, um, is our own experience, our experimentation. We are starting to experiment with uh, generative AI, more precisely large language model. I will speak about it later. Um, and, uh, and I will combine this personal, let's say, 
Eurostat experience with this general framework. So uh, indeed, uh, my aim is to give you a sense of what is generative AI in large language model in this AI landscape, but to address or at least discuss a bit the risk and the challenge, and they are important. We are still in the very infancy of the generative AI, and we are so there is a kind of uh, inf uh, uh, hype or inflated expectation at this stage, but we expect much disillusion uh, later on. Uh, we'll expose also the use, Eurostat use case, and wh one way we found that could be, and is known to be the future of large language model at the moment, but could be a flavor, it could be. And then looking for the future perspective, uh, calling on building the case for internal international cooperation, and uh, making some advertisement for, uh, uh, um, um, <clears throat> Sorry, for an uh, initiative that we are launching at uh, European level on one-stop shop on AI ML. Um, but let me give you a bit of context also, because yesterday, uh, uh, actually, I, I could uh, just repeat what Robert Kishner said uh, on why we need innovation. And uh, uh, the need for innovation, it's, it's vital for official statistics in this, this, this new data ecosystem. Uh, we need to innovate on what we produce, and that means we need timely, uh, more detailed statistics needed to meet user demand, this user aspect, um, and multidimensional one, combining different sources. And we need to innovate on how we do things, so we need to, uh, the European statistical system, but any other statistical organization, must be more so responsive and agile and resi uh, resilient to crisis. And there we hope we can build on the new technologies to help and the new data source to do this. So um, this, again, a bit of digression, not a digression, but this was very well understood by the head of the Statistical Institute in the European Statistical System. And this was uh, uh, put uh, explicitly in the uh, NSS Innovation Agenda, which set the goals. So the, the goals are, are, are uh, repeating what I just said, strengthening the, uh, the accessibility to respond rapidly, augment the product and service portfolio, the output site, and uh, realize efficiency gain uh, to free up resource and strengthen the resilience to shock, exactly. So the, the process side. So we, this innovation agenda focus on both on product innovation and process innovation. And the means, you of course leverage technology, leverage uh, recent technological development, but also building on cooperation, building on internal in, through the European statistical system, but also external cooperation. So that's a call for cooperation, and I will build it later on. And indeed, in the design of the ESS innovation agenda, there was much contact between ESS and the other stakeholders, ECB, uh, not yet IMF. <laughs> Uh, but uh, UNEC, John Research Center, it's very important. It, there is also a cross-domain thinking, which is uh, kind of efficiency in the approach, uh, building on, on common grounds uh, to do, but to do really innovation, and the focus is on implementing innovation. And what are the topics you will see? And I, of course, then I will focus on artificial intelligence. The topic you will see in this, uh, in this strategic document is that Indeed, artificial intelligence and machine learning, because it's it's there to uh, to make efficiency gain in the data processing and supporting and complex and resource intensive processes, but also privacy enhancing techniques, uh, which is seen. I will not detail, of course, which is seen as an alternative to direct data sharing, especially in the case of privately held data, especially mobile network operators. So we feel it it's could be an asset to engage with this, uh, with this uh, 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 private data holder in the sense that the, the data that are shared actually are not shared. They are used, reused, but not seeing them. So that's uh, promising. Smart technology, smart device to collect, uh, to collect data, uh, to be more resilient. Uh, data integration to produce this, uh, uh, to produce this multidimensional statistics that are badly needed in, the, in our days. Exploiting the geospatial capabilities, especially in the case of earth observation and so on, and leveraging the cloud, the cloud, uh, the cloud uh, opportunities. Let's say the cloud technologies not only to be agile, uh, building up new system and, 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 
and doing experimentation with new data, but also with, because it provides opportunity to, to share more, uh, uh, to share uh, the, the, the components which are developed there. And finally, there is, a, of course, a need to update the quality, uh, the quality framework because this new data source and the new technologies are changing the paradigm. Oops. Okay, so now coming to the topic, uh, AI and official statistics. So it's not from today. It's, uh, uh, there is, as I, I will still refer to the, the, fo the foundational work of the, the UNEC uh, and the HLG MOS on this, uh, which has been great to, uh, let's say, make sense of this search of new technologies already five or six years ago. And they are well documented use case for this uh, for this AI and, of, uh, and in official statistics, and the main goal is definitely improving efficiency and statistical service. So data collection uh, is one of the use case. You can now uh, let's say uh, generating questionnaire, do uh, on the fly adaptive sampling. You can optimize your field work uh, based on on these technologies. Uh, data processing and cleaning doing automatic imputation, uh, uh, data cleansing, and uh, art layer detection, but also typically classification, the work there. Uh, quantitative analysis, when you extract web data, you need to extract the information, quantitative information, that's, that's one of the typical use case. Uh, or data uh, analyzing Im image from a, a satellite image, for instance. Qualitative analysis, making comments, generating reports, uh, and, and, and uh, based on data, automatically this. You will find in the, in the reference I put there, which is the white paper I mentioned in the beginning, you will find different use cases along this, this path, especially in Statistics Canada. It's proved to be useful as well. Uh, data knowledge discovery, you can tag automatically and generate metadata in most contexts, easing the, research, the search of the data. Improving data user experience chatbot, uh, uh, it's well known for several times now. And of course, operational efficiency in support service, translation, memory, email, summarization, that's something that's com com quite common. So this use case exists for several time. They have not, I've not been waiting for generative AI. There are other techniques and I will provide a, an outlook of the landscape. Uh, there are, um, so this technique exists or this system exists for some time, but we will see, we see in the, in the upcoming of generative AI, we see um, uh, a boost in this, uh, at least uh, not an inflation, but a boost of, of this use case facilitated actually the access to this kind of use case. So that's, so I speak now indeed about this, uh, this new phenomenon, which is what we call generative pre-trained transformer. So for many people, for many people, uh, this is a, a disruption in the, in, the, in the history of artificial intelligence. Actually, people think that now start artificial intelligence is starting. It's not true. But, uh, and what are these generative spray train transformers? Just to give you a sense of the timeline and the speed of it. So the, the technology was there uh, already in 2018. Uh, with the, this general pre-trained transformer, GPT, you have heard of, of course about it. Uh, and with, it was already, already a very complex uh, model. It was uh, trained there and uh, measured by the number of parameters. And then there was a constant evolution and the constant in complexity, evolution in the complexity, GPT-2 in 2019, GPT-3 in 2020. And until then, there was still uh, much use I didn't know about it. Uh, it was much used in, 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 in laboratory. It was not widely uh, known by the public. But in November 2022, uh, they put on top of GPT-3, they put a chatbot, so the ability to interact with the system um, through natural language. And this uh, revealed to be a clash, a boom in the in the world. Uh, let's say in, more, in less than a month, uh, there were more than 1 million users. And uh, we were early 2023. So, uh, 
And again, at that time, uh, uh, there was a release of an improved model, GPT-4, which is much more complex, much more bigger. And this, this trend, this speed was driven, of course, there was an increase of accuracy in the, in the, the, the model that was uh, proposed, but it, of course it was based on, on, on big players like Google, uh, OpenAI, in the case of GPT, uh, Microsoft, NVIDIA, or whatever. So, this, this market is dominated. So just stepping back a bit, what we are speaking when we are speaking about generative AI. This, this slide was meant to be interactive, but anyway, so artificial intelligence is a field. Oops. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's say that, uh, as oh my God. <laughs> Let's say that you have heard about generative AI and large language model. I come to the, what are the large, large language model? Um, they are advanced AI systems trained on vast amount of text. Actually the web, they, they are trained on web data, the web, the collect, uh, text collecting on the web to generate human light text. They are very good at this. So how they work, the model, the model predict the next word on the output sentence, like a, a stochastic parrot. Uh, the content is generated by deep neural network. I skip this. Parameters are adjusted during the training phase. The strength is that they are a very efficient and text-related task. They can understand nuance, regenerating human quality uh, uh, quality text. It's very stunning. This, the foundational model can be fine-tuned, adapted to your task and uh, for specific tasks. Indeed, so the standard task uh, you have come through because you have probably test it, analyze text, answer questions, summarize, translate, generate text. Limitation, prone to hallucination. There is well-documented case where the, what uh, this model produces are nonsensical at all, and uh, um, they are inaccuracy and perturbating biased and training data. So the cost of fine-tuning fine this to improve these characters are enormous, and they are not at reach of an, a single organization. So the risk and challenge, uh, the risk and challenge, uh, they are ethical risk, I will skip them. Uh, this, risk, this risk and challenge are actually well known in the domain of artificial intelligence, but they need to be instantiated in, in the case of large language model. First, because we don't know, for ethics, uh, we need to control the output, we don't know what to harm. Uh, Regarding accuracy and bias, uh, we have this hallucination and indeed the propagation of bias from the training data that we don't control. And in this case, it's very hard to control and, and, and accuracy need to be, require new, 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 um, new metrics. Privacy and data protection, IPR, it's completely uncontrolled in this case with the, these big models. And transparency, it's illusion. It's not a hallucination, it's illusion. These large language models are black box. They limit, uh, uh, we don't have access to algorithm. Of course, there's a trend to develop open source, which can be, but the complexity of the model makes them actually very complex to explain to and to communicate to others. So this communication aspect. So I'll <laughs> try to finish. Yes, I try to finish to what we are going to explore, what we are exploring. Uh, the the Eurostat use case is the, uh, there's three levels of complexity. The statistical assistance, the application enables users to search for relevant data, for relevant Eurostat data based on simple text description and recommend the relevant data source to be used. The second level is to fetch the data because not only this model can be used to uh, answer your question, but also to code some, some uh, script to retrieve the data. And last, we, want, we see an opportunity also to develop uh, analytics on top. So this one was the most complex, so I will skip. But the, indeed, there is, <coughs> there is, uh, there is uh, a trend nowadays, as I said, the future of large language model that proved to be uh, quite, we are quite optimistic with our experimentation. So the case for experimental data, <laughs> for international cooperation, this we will not, uh, we will not cut me. Indeed, there is much work to be carried out in common, in the con in whatever context. Uh, 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 model customization is 
fine-tuning costs enormous. There is a ways to improve the current model to fine-tune them, but they are uh, they, they require a lot of resource. Mutualization, federation is good. Data curation, we have a bulk of common data, common concept that could be leveraged in, in such a system, especially <coughs> because the beauty of the, the approach I could not explain was that you can constrain the model to fetch the answer into a corpus of information you pre-select, you feed in the data. That's the new paradigm. Pooling skills, they are mentioned. Uh, infrastructure sharing, impact on, 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 on CO2 emission, accumulating experience, developing use case. So, uh, and then, I stop there. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'll stop it. Thank you very much. Clearly, there was a lot of order to bring to the chaos, and yeah. I think you've done an excellent job. I invite everybody to really read your presentation and the adjoining paper very carefully, as well as the different references that you put. And if there's any pressing questions, we will have some time after uh, uh, the next two presentations. I want to ask uh, Graham Pilgrim to take the uh, stage. Uh, Graham uh, works at the, uh, at the OECD. He's an, uh, an, uh, an analyst uh, with a strong specialization in big data and real-time data even. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been really nice to have him on this panel. I remember working with him uh, five, six, seven years ago at the OECD. Uh, and even then, he was uh, uh, very inspiring with new data sources and new ways of visualization. So I'm really curious to see what you have to offer. An ocean of data. So. That sounds like a very interesting promise. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for the introduction, uh, Fabian. Um, so just to introduce the topic, um, I think Alessandra and I are, are going to essentially talk about roughly the same thing. Um, so maybe I'll focus more on kind of what the data is and what you can potentially do with it. And Alessandra will look at some use cases and a platform that the IMF have developed to kind of analyze and look at this in more detail. So without further ado, let's get started. So what is AIS data? Now, essentially, this is a machine that people want to put on their ships to stop them crashing into other vessels. So in some ways, it's kind of like to, um, to shipping what maybe the mobile phone is to, to tourists. So we've got sort of some links there to, you know, sort of the big data, huge volumes of information that we're getting, that we're getting through. Um, and essentially, legally, Certain vessels are actually required to have it, so anyone over a particular vessel size needs to have this receiver installed. But the cost of installing this receiver is quite small, um, so a lot of people optionally choose to install it because it has so many benefits. Um, and then when this um, receiver is installed, essentially what happens, depending on how fast you're traveling and uh, what's happening with your vessel, maybe you're turning and, and things like that, um, your output, essentially the speed that you're traveling at, the, the uh, direction you're facing, and also some positional data, so your longitude and latitude. Um, there's also some static data in there, such as the uh, destination where you are going to arrive in, um, and also things about your vessel, so how deep is it in the water and things like this. So we can kind of begin to think about how maybe we might use this for proxying some form of trade indicator. Um, essentially, this data in totality is huge. So we have information basically from 2019 onwards until basically now. Um, everything is hosted through the UN Global Platform, so it gives access to a wide number of people and anyone who's interested in accessing this data get in contact with either myself or Alessandra and we can point you in the right direction to get access. Um, but in terms of orders of magnitude, we're talking billions, um, if not trillions of um, you know, information points here. It has been filtered down a little bit to what's on the platform, but you're going to need to start using big data technologies, things like Hadoop and Spark. Um, so when we move into um, merchandise trade, essentially, uh, shipping accounts for 80% of volume. So if we're able to understand this, then hopefully we can get some good proxies for, for trade. Um, we're near to real time. So for example, we can look basically the updates to the platform are every four hours. So we can tell you what was going on four hours ago, essentially. 
Um, and then we've got a high level of granularity, so we can tell what vessels are, what size they are, who owns them, where they're located. But the big issue we have is essentially we don't know when they're within a port or not. So we have to kind of think creatively as to how we define a port and how we can get that information out. So there's been a number of methods that we've tried throughout time. Sort of the simplest method started with taking a database of ports with a longitude and latitude position, draw a point, put a circle around it. Any vessel that goes in shows some characteristics of being, of being static. We say that's a port visit. Um, there are some weaknesses with that, essentially, if you're passing through. Um, so, for example, the, think about, you know, sort of some of the largest ports you could pass through as you're going elsewhere, Panama Canal, for example, and things like this. Um, so there was an investigation into dbScan, uh, which is basically a machine learning method to kind of try and create these cluster patterns. However, you don't have a huge amount of control and you're kind of really led by uh, the algorithm there. Um, so the results were promising, but not completely there. Um, then it was kind of decided that maybe the best way is to go through manual definition of port locations. So for example, the data that Alessandra is going to show you is basically the tireless work of one individual going around and manually identifying where ports are. Um, and then where the OECD approach kind of differed a little bit is we tried to step back from that and think about what information we could use. Um, so we're using kind of um, essentially looking for the static vessels, which we've talked about. So essentially we're looking for boats which aren't traveling. So we look at the current message, the next message that follows in the database and the previous, and we're looking for basically the speeds to all be zero. There to be minimal heading change. So for example, if you're in a berth, in a port, it's unlikely that your vessel is going to move. So we're looking for the heading change to be basically very, very small. So we've got plus or minus one degree there. And then also for there to be little movement change. If you're mo moored, then you're unlikely to move in that position. So we look for minimal movement in that longitude and latitude position. Um, it should be noted there is some inaccuracy in here. So we fit, put our kind of level at about 10 meters movement just to deal with some of the rounding errors that can happen on these on this data and then also there's static data that vessel captains can provide so for example you can say whether you're moored or whether you're an anchor so we're looking for vessels which are primarily in the uh in the moored state which kind of indicates that they're um at a at a at a port berth and then where we differ slightly is we start using the um, vessel characteristics, so the length and the width of the vessel, to then try and determine exactly where that berth is. So this is probably the first time since my university days where I've used some geometry, uh, which has been <laughs> quite fun. Um, so um, essentially what we do, we take the longitude and latitude position of the vessel, and then we use the width of the vessel and the length of the vessel to determine a potential polygon where that vessel could be. And we aggregate this all up for the millions of records that we have and create a database. So behind you can see a demonstration for Valencia. So what you can see is there's actually quite a good alignment there with where the location should have, uh, sort of align with where birth locations are. So it gives us a really, really fine level of detail. And this obviously just for, for Valencia, we have around 600,000 little tiny polygons essentially, which corresponds to the world. Um, so then our next issue is you've got a polygon, you know that's a port, but you don't know what it's associated with. So there's a database of something called UN lock codes, which assigns basically um, a port to a code. Um, there is coordinate data for around 60% of these. So then we have to manually add some additional information. So for example, what we've done is we've complemented that with the World Port Index, but that's still not complete. So you get to around sort of 90% coverage. And then what we've then done is we've used a geographic place name database and used fuzzy matching. So Lechtenstein distances and things like that to try and basically match the location in with a port name and then we get to around 95% coverage. So this is covering the vast majority 
of ports. Then we take the polygon, the 600,000 polygons we have, find the closest port from our database, and then voila, we have a matching, and we can begin to build some indicators. Um, so simply what we can do is look for when a vessel comes in and out of a port, uh, and then log that as a port visit. So what I've got here is a graph for, for Ireland. Um, so the blue line is the official data, whereas the gray line is what we've derived for our, for our method. So as you can see, there are some differences. Um, it's not completely there. Uh, the Irish also did try another method as well, so that's shown in the green line. Um, but the nice thing here is what you can see is we've extended the official data by two quarters, so we're very much more timely than, than what exists there. Minor differences, this is due to definition, so inland water trans transit is not counted, whereas we find it very difficult to exclude that in our database. So there is some weaknesses, but there's a lot of comparability and, and, uh, and applications there that can be had. Um, then we can also go down to the individual port level and monitor some um, sort of large events. So Alessandro will talk about this a little bit more, but for example, you have the impacts after an earthquake. So this is Iskenderun in Turkey. So the earthquake stuck, uh, struck in around January, February of 2023. So you can see that initial dropout on the number of vessels visiting that port. Um, there was a fire at the port as well added to that, so the port infrastructure was destroyed too. Um, so it's taken a gradual amount of time for that to return back to a kind of business as usual type pattern. So we can kind of look at those sort of maybe longer term issues, but then we can also look at short term issues. So uh, in Felixstowe, which is in the United Kingdom, there were strikes uh, back in 2022. And what you can see around the August, September mark, um, the number of vessels coming into port drops down suddenly to zero. And likewise, there was then a follow-up strike in the September. So you can see a second drop down there. So it can tell you a little bit maybe about some of these short-term supply chain uh, disruptions. And then because we have information on when vessels have arrived and departed from a port, we can begin to build some metrics. So one of the things we've done is we've looked at the time that a vessel leaves the previous port um, and the time it arrives at its next destination. Then we can have a look at the distance um, that's been traveled on there and then give a kind of measure of how long it's taken for the vessel to make it to port. Now, the reason this is interesting is because we have these really granular um, vessel berths, essentially, if the vessel has to wait outside the port, before it can dock in a berth, we can find out how efficiently the port is operating. So this one behind us is for Los Angeles and Long Beach. And I think you're probably all quite aware of some of the efficiency issues there. Um, and you can see basically what happens, the light blue line, um, as we get into the later half of 2020, we have that drop down right in the entry speed of vessels getting into Los Angeles and Long Beach. It, gradually recovers, but then the supply chain issues then hit again. So we have reduction down towards the end um, of, uh, of 2022. And then it's kind of recovered to almost normal now, but there's still some element there. We also then have a metric of handling speed. So how much dead weight of a vessel is being handled per second within that port environment. And this gives you an idea of maybe the efficiency of that port, the speed of turnaround that it could actually deliver. So, yeah. Um, so my final things are just to say that there's a dashboard available online. So if you look at the presentation that uh, hopefully you all have access to, there's a link there which will take you through to a dashboard where you can explore all of this data and kind of think about how it might well be useful for your own purposes. Um, and there's going to be a paper released shortly from the OECD on our methodology and how to uh, how we've kind of used this data, which should be available in the next month or so. And likewise, any questions, just get in contact with me or grab me during a coffee break. Thank you. Great, M many thanks, Graham. And, and we'll continue the presentations indeed on, on, on ports, uh, but we move from the ocean to space. So Alessandra uh, Sossi from the IMF 
uh, will present us uh, about the work that is going on. Uh, she's a data analytics uh, uh, officer. And I'm very much curious to see the results and findings. Already the pictures look amazing. Uh, Alessandra, the floor is yours. Um, is it working? Okay. Uh, yes, well, uh, what Graham just presented is kind of like um, uh, an excellent ex example of uh, the statistical community coming together. We are very fortunate that the UN has made this data accessible for national, international, and the academia, in the organization and the academia. So what I'm going to continue uh, the discussion is with uh, the presentation of this uh, platform that we released in November. And it's about monitoring trade disruption from space. Um, from space because these signals are captured by the satellites. And that's the connection there. So uh, in our team, we have uh, representatives from different departments of the IMF. So we have the statistics department. Uh, but we also have trade uh, economists with trade expertise. And we also have Jasper with, from the univers University of Oxford who brought his um, expertise in climate risk modeling and geospatial modeling. So why ports? Uh, so ports, because of their uh, proximity to the coast, uh, they are subject to climate extremes. And so in this picture, you can see the past 30 years of cyclones and with the more recent one highlighted in blue, and you can see that uh, some of the ports are hit uh, in some part of the world are hit, hit over and over uh, by these climate extremes. So, for example, Pacific Island country is a perfect uh, example of countries where um, official data are scarce, uh, scarce resource. They are available with one year of lag, so access to this kind of like <laughs> estimate is very helpful, can be very helpful, and in particular, it can be helpful in the time of crisis, uh, such those caused by climate extremes. So um, Jasper, in his research at the University of Oxford, they kind of like um, assess uh, what are the impact of this uh, um, disruption co caused by climate extremes. So we can see that the median is six days, uh, but it can be up to 22 days and they can cause infrastructure, infrastructure damages, delays, and that leads to trade disruptions. Um, here are some numbers that they estimated in terms of like the uh, values um, the, caused by these trade disruptions. And important things here maybe is like that these values are going to increase in the future years due to the increase of climate change impact. So what we have done with this platform is trying to bring together uh, three different layers of analysis. One is the monitoring uh, based on the real-time AIS data uh, that can allow us to see the immediate uh, impact of a disruption. Then we also provide an analysis of the spillovers, uh, the ports being interconnected. Uh, a disruption hitting one port doesn't end there, but it also like, has effects throughout the port network, and also climate scenario tools that bring in the climate risk uh, for future climate scenarios. So in a way, bringing like uh, policy together to manage system-wide climate risk. So next, I will go <coughs> into the browser. OK. Uh, to give basically a quick demo of the of the portwatch platform. Uh, so in the home page, you can see here the kind of like the number of ports that we cover. We cover about 1,400 ports around the world, and also 13 choke points, so major canal and straits um, around the world. In numbers, uh, 1,400 ports. We also track 120,000 vessels. Uh, we have data since 2019, daily data. And the ports that we cover are identified based this concept of uh, systematic, uh, systemic importance, which is familiar in the bank system. Uh, so at the global level, but also at the regional level and the national level. 
and that kind of like allows us to cover about 99% of the international trade, and that is estimated to be by UN TAD of 14 trillion US dollars. Um, in the home page, we highlight obviously the idea initially was to was brought by climate extreme, but obviously given recent events, we also recently transitioned to geopolitical tensions and uh, disruption caused by the similar to the one caused by the in the Red Sea. So um, we have disruption pages. So in each disruption page, we look in detail at the impact of the disruption. So you can see here that the ports and the choke points uh, that are kind of like involved in this, uh, detected to be impacted by the disruption are obviously the Bab and Manda Strait near Yemen, the Suez Canal because of like a subsequent, subsequent kind of like propagation of the impact, and the Cape of Good Hope where trade has been basically diverted to. And we can see that in the real-time charts. So here is the Suez Canal, and we can see that the impact really, we started really seeing the impact early in December, and at, inside the MF we were already wondering what would be the impact on inflation and other subsequent impacts, like if this were to sustain. Um, so the impact, the reduction of trade uh, of daily passage is about, um, it was about 40 45% a few days ago, and that's kind of in line with what the Egyptian authority have reported in terms of loss of revenues for the daily passage of the ships that are missed. Then we have the Babelman Strait, and we have instead we also see an increase of about 60% of the Cape of Good Hope, so with ships being rerouted to circumnavigate Africa. Uh, this kind of like add up to another disruption that was already ongoing at the Panama Canal due to a drought uh, that started a few months ago. And we can see also here, <coughs> Panama Canal uh, kind of like um, covering 5% of the 5% uh, of global daily passages. And so we also see a about 30% result, the reduction of <coughs> passages there. Um, with when it comes to climate disruption, we have this uh, disruption monitor uh, here, where you can see a collection of disruption that we have collected since 2019. And each disruption comes with also their own page. So here we can see a cyclone that hit uh, Southeast Asia in July and affected uh, five ports. So, so. Uh, we provide some indication, also the real-time data, of course, where we can see the impact in the AIS data, and that's the beauty, really, of this data. Um, we also provide some information about the importance of this port for the economy. So we can see Kaohsiung being one, the largest port for the Taiwanese economy, and the majority of export and import. And we also provide estimate of the spillover effects uh, for upstream and downstream ports. Uh, so what would be the trade, va trade volume at risk, so the capacity at risk for these connected ports. And then we also do an assessment uh, in terms of country impact, uh, so in terms of import value and export value as a percent of GDP and maritime trade. Um, so this is the assessment that we do for, um, oh, see, and also like, um, if you take, what, for example, this port that I mentioned earlier, uh, you can see that if you go in the port page, you can see that uh, actually Doxuri was not only the, the first uh, cyclone that hit the port, there were two subsequent ones, and a third one, which we, for the severity of the cyclone, we didn't detect it, but it had an impact as well. And so you can see that one of the largest ports in Taiwan was hit three times in a couple of few months. Um, so this is kind of like the, um, the real-time component of the platform. We then have a spillover, <coughs> spillover simulator that basically allows you to select a port and decide kind of like the number of days uh, that you you can select the number of days that the port you assume is being shut down. And then, uh, like in this country level impact, you, we see the, we measure the impact in terms of import or export for the connecting countries. 
And when you, this is based on a combination of AIS data, but also efficient data in order to as, uh, assign the value of the impound, and then we calculate it as a percent of GDP. Uh, and also the combination with um, official data allows us to kind of like have a breakdown by industry. We kind of like define these 11 industries and uh, as a kind of like a medium term improvement, we are trying to now move to something that is more like maybe statistically relevant, so to, to H, HS code uh, I breakdown definition. Uh, in the spillover simulator, yeah, you can assess the impact at the port level, that will be in terms of uh, volume uh, impacted for the connected ports, but also in terms of the supply chain impact. Uh, so that will be in terms of like uh, industry output and consumption, which will also include landlocked countries and is based with a combination of supply input output data. Input output. Finally, the final component of the platform is the climate scenario tool, which basically allows you to select the countries and assess the portfolio of ports uh, that handle your trade and combine that uh, with the final risk that is combined with uh, the RCP projections, so climate risks. Uh, so if I could, in, for example, here we have Spain uh, here highlighted and here are all the ports that uh, kind of like top 100 ports that are most climate vulnerable. And uh, as I mentioned, the risk is kind of like defined based on the import export that they handle, but also based on the risk to which these ports are subject to for different climate hazards. So this is a nutshell of all the different components of the PortWatch platform. Um, so since I have still Okay, so we have um, like the access data uh, page where you can find the details uh, and the research behind uh, all this data, but also have access to it. Um, yeah, um, maybe as things that we are, it's in the ma making. Uh, we are uh, we have done like um, an analysis uh, back in for the World Economic Outlook that look at the impact of um, the sanction and how that has shifted uh, oil tanker coming from Russia and the trade, uh, um, the export of oil trade from Russia. So we are kind of like now going to expand that and look in more details of the fragmentation issue. And also we are looking at uh, now casting of um, using AIS data uh, for country level um, yeah, trade flows. Uh, thank you. Many thanks to all three of the presenters for completely living up to the promise I made that it would be very exciting uh, future forward discussion. Uh, we are slowly moving towards our coffee break, but I do want to ask, uh, allow for a few questions from the audience, because I think that certainly is merited. I saw a question in the back. Thank you very much for this uh, exciting and exotic presentation. This is a question about the trade and the, but also the LLM models. We have been working experimentally with them, and one thing that we find it is that problems in consistency. So they are very sensitive to the prompt, the way that you ask, ask them the themes. Um, 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 they suffer from these butterfly effects. So my question is whether from the official places uh, we could have uh, a rules and a standard of course of how to uh, ask for, the, for these specific purposes, for uh, research, for analysis, for getting statistics, for catalogs. And I think that this will be very, very useful for our research. The second it is for the two uh, magnificent uh, trade presentation. I think that these uh, vessels, AIS uh, system, are very useful in, in terms of the uh, shock points, uh, special events, uh, sanctions, and so on. But I, uh, I will ask you, what is your perception for more regular, uh, let's say, flows of export and imports? At the end, what is the time lag when uh, 
the ship gets to port. And this is finally an official statistic, which is when the good uh, passes the uh, custom duty. Um, uh, so, thank you. Many thanks. I think I saw Robert here in the front. Oh. <laughs> Ja. We wait for Robert. Yeah. Good morning, I'm Good Matthias morning. Ludwig. I'm yes. working for Eurostat. Thank you, Graham, for this very informative uh, presentation. I have a question to slide number two, the ownership. Mm -hmm. um, around a vessel, there are various layers of ownership. For example, the disponent owner or the special purpose vehicle, which is a legal owner of the vessel. Um, what is your definition of ownership? Do you use uh, chart arrangements or... Lloyd's database. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> also from my side, many thanks for these inspiring presentations. Jean-Marc, you used a sentence and this is, I would like to say, the basis for my uh, question. Transparency is an illusion. <laughs> and um, I think you're right in, in this regard. So. My question to you, but perhaps also to the other panelists, is and also where do you see the differences between official statistics and other data providers in the future? Thank you. Thank you. I see Bert. Yeah, I like so much the title of this session, Future <laughs> Forward. I yeah. think innovation is key. Uh, if you're in the world of data and statistics, we need to innovate to um, stay relevant when society and economy is changing so much. Um, um, I think I have a question for Jean-Marc, um, and this is about international cooperation, uh, because LLMs are kind of new, everyone is experimenting with it. Um, and the high-level group of MOS modernization, people work together to, to do things together. Um, but what, what comes after that? Um, for example, um, in the IMF, we just uh, developed uh, a chatbot based on uh, LLM. Uh, we're going to launch it internally uh, two, three weeks from now inside the IMF, so we can ask a national que uh, language questions on, on data, and it generates query on our own databases. So there's no hallucination, there's just, um, well, data retrieved uh, from our own data sets. Um, and it's described in the High Level Group MOS modernization paper. Uh, but this is based on STMX, and this is not something particularly to the IMF, and we want to share it. So we work together with uh, Eric Anfar from the OECD, we work together, we're going to visit BIS. Um, but, but what's the vision now in the European Union and Eurostat on um, not developing things together because I think we work together already, but how can we um, have solutions like this maintained internationally, shared, a, a, a fundamental model that, that these IT systems are really maintained in production and not only uh, research and experimental. So I uh, would be welcome to have any vision on that. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. I think you can pass you to the front. In front of you, <laughs> other front, you. yes. <laughs> so, uh, fantastic presentations, and many thanks. Uh, I just want to stress how important from a uh, policy and not just economic perspective, this type of work is um, range. I mean, this, you mentioned the, you know, sanctions and what happens to um, oil tankers since, uh, you know, the imposition of the price caps and other limitations on, on Russia's trade. Uh, the Houthis uh, and the consequences, you know, of, of the restrictions for shipping in the Suez Canal, literally, should Europeans send boats, you know, military, uh, um, uh, think of military uh, interventions to, to limit the, uh, uh, this, the, the trade disruptions. I mean, this is really a measure, an issue of cost and benefits. So just absolutely spectacular. Just one quick question on what happens when uh, uh, ships um, turn off the transponders. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I had a question here from Carlos. No, I think yeah, Maria just stole my question because oh. <laughs> uh, I have, I mean, I think you were mentioning, Alessandra, how useful this has been in the, with the recent events uh, in the Red Sea, but precisely vessels were getting rid of their location devices just to avoid being attacked, right? I mean. Which is uh, so uh, it's uh, a more general question about resilience of this data. How we can, uh, first of all, if you have detected that this is happening, and second, uh, whether there is something that can be done to augment, let's say, the resilience of, of this data. And then another one to you, Mark. Uh, uh, we had very interesting side conversations yesterday with colleagues from Denmark uh, about the uh, success or unsuccessful 
uh, examples that we have in the use of artificial intelligence, I was telling them that we have not been very successful asking very open questions to ChatGPT to delve into the internet and get us uh, uh, simple answers to very simple questions. It was making many mistakes, but then they told me that they have been much more successful into asking very specific questions uh, on papers, uh, you know, constraining somehow uh, the questions. They were telling me, you ask good questions, you get good answers, and, and the, the opposite <laughs> is true. So I think you mentioned this in your presentation, but you were going very fast at the end of the presentation, so perhaps you can elaborate on constrained versus unconstrained uh, questions to chat GPT. Man, many thanks. I think we, I, I want to stop with the questions because I see still quite a few hands and we are already in the coffee break. So I want to give the time both to all the three presenters to reflect on the questions that were being posed as well as allow us at least 15 minutes for some good coffees. So uh, maybe we will go in the uh, reverse order of the presentations uh, and uh, Alessandra, you want to tackle the first set of questions? This? Okay. Yep. So I think there was a question from uh, uh, by the time that uh, the the data go as has been is identified as a port calls and uh, the time is then recorded by in the custom. <laughs> I think it can be quite sometimes maybe month. Uh, so yes, there is a time lag uh, difference between uh, the two. The good thing about uh, working in this community and uh, facilitated by the UN is that uh, there has been uh, some organization who has access to custom data. And so they've been able to map the two. And based on what we've seen is that the correlation seems to be still quite good. Obviously with uh, those uh, kind of like con uh, considerations in mind. Um, in terms of difference of official statistics and other data sources, uh, well, there are some things uh, that need to be taken into account while looking at this AIS data. Um, things that has been mentioned also in other presentations, sometimes you have issues with the data provider, so sometimes it's not a drop in the in trade, but it's just a drop in maybe a, a problem in the ingestion. So sometimes you have to be uh, careful. Uh, so there is some evaluation there. So there are some measures that are in place in order to avoid uh, for our data to go out uh, in those cases. Um, obviously, um, AIS data, we measure volume. Official statistics are in value. So how do we go from the one to the other when in the spillover simulator we use official statistics to kind of like map the two um, so so the, there is the, that, and then obviously uh, the the issue with the transport transponder being switched off uh, is another thing. Uh, there is a nice paper in Nature that uh, kind of in depth analyzed uh, and quantified the um, the amount of like that um, this phenomena effect. Uh, the number of vessels actually being there. Um, based on like an hour like analysis, because we tracked when the vessel entered the port, by that time we kind of like assume that the, the transporter gets switched on because it's by law, uh, it is required. Um, of course, there is also issue with spoofing, that's kind of like an illegal activity, but that's kind of like illegal activity. Uh, that is also not captured maybe elsewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, so for example, in the case of the sanction was also like quite relevant issue. Uh, but again, because of the analysis focused more on ports, um, we kind of have to like have a sense that by then uh, the transporter gets switched on. Um, maybe it is not the right message, maybe they are like kind of like assuming another kind of vessel identity, uh, but um, we can still measure the port call and volume trade. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Graham? Um, I think maybe just to add to the kind of timeliness of this data, um, because you also have uh, the intended destination 
and uh, the time of arrival and sometimes you can get this a number of days beforehand it does actually allow you to kind of maybe project a couple of you know days or weeks potentially in advance of maybe actually receiving the actual vessel in port so there is potentially scope for maybe moving from a nowcast to a forecast um, to come to Matthias's point um, there's a number of uh, metrics that we can get in the database so essentially we have access to what's called Lloyd's register so we can have essentially the group beneficial owner um, the chartering company and the vessel owner so it can be broken down in a number of different ways uh, depending on your needs and requirements um, so I've been in contact with people that for example have been trying to explore you know sort of transport costs potentially by broken down by that vessel ownership so there is scope for maybe doing that um, then I think on the point on official statistics uh, versus other data providers I'm a really big fan of the label experimental statistics <laughs> um, I think it works quite well and I think it also immediately puts the flags up that this maybe is not wasn't collected for the purposes that um, it wasn't meant for. I'll give one good example. Um, so, for example, with this AIS data, um, unless you know the data source, you wouldn't know that there was a maintenance window between the 8th and 9th of January this year. So for that reason, we lost a lot of data during that period. So there's drops in data during that time period because of that. If you don't know the data, you don't know <laughs> it's experimental. You may well make the wrong assumption <laughs> on the basis of that. So, um, yeah, big fan of the words experimental. <laughs> Many thanks, uh, Jemma. <coughs> Thank you very much for the, to the audience for letting give me a chance to develop a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> what I could not. So indeed, uh, uh, to, to echo the two questions on on the accuracy and the, the consistency and uh, the, cons the constraint. Um, so what we see uh, with the large language model, it's uh, the emergence of a new discipline, which is prompt engineering, how you prompt the system. And there is a direct impact on the quality. So there are different ways to prompt the system. You 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 define instruction, the way you want to uh, do the results. You provide the context, and that's where you can constrain as well, uh, because this model are smart enough to, to put sufficient emphasis on the context and reuse the context you provide. In this case of Eurostat, let's say the whole corpus of information that is on the web, that is structured in a vector database, and would then be used to to answer that. So there is a way, and I guess that's the way you, that was also implemented. So the, this, this, this prompt engineering is critical. So you were asking for guidelines. Uh, there are, at least to my knowledge, there are none at commission level. We have, well, at least, just the, the idea that there's a structure. You f start with instruction, you give the context, and then you ask your question is a way. But uh, there is a full discipline, and, and the transparency, which is an illusion, at least we have an aim to go to, towards transparency. It's the way you prompt, at least you reproduce, and which, which model you use. Again, the model we are using at nowadays are, are really uh, close, so at least, but there is a tendency to see every day, every, every second day, there is a new model <laughs> and open source, which are much more transparent in the terms of use of resource, uh, of use of data, they have, they have the training data they have used and the way the, the system works, even though they are very complex. So, um, so I have no guidelines. I have promise, promising way to constrain the, 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 the model to answer in a corpus, within a corpus of information uh, uh, that I give. At the moment, I have prompt. I could hope in the future that we would also train a uh, large language model in the context of let's say, official statistics in the statistical world, so that we also improve the efficiency. But uh, it's at the moment, we have this, this, this type of uh, resource to do it. It's promising. As I said, there's a lot of uh, expectation, inflated expectation. There will be a lot of disillusion. If you start with ChatGPT, it's, f it's definitely not, uh, uh, it's, it's not. You have to iterate and to build your, your knowledge. Um, 
the future of statistics. Uh, uh, what is the how do, how do I see the future of statistics? I think it's a, it's it's there will be a reflection, and I'm not the f the, the one that is most competent on, on this, um, but. Definitely, uh, in this ocean of data, uh, we have some assets. So we we are careful about we care about yeah, our users. We know our users. Um, the users are are driving our our uh, our offer. Um, so this this uh, this is one aspect that would differentiate uh, maybe uh, uh, with with respect to the, to the other data processes. But again, I would s make a difference between what we still produce with new data source and so on, where we have an ambition to be as much as transparent as, as possible. We have a quality framework we need to to, ad to adapt. Of it already exists in the notion of trade-off. We might smooth, smoothen it in the, in the future, but there is a whole challenge to adapt the quality framework. That's why it, it was put as a, a key priority as well in the in the um, in, in the chat. I'm sorry, <laughs> no, no, I have no. to do it again. <laughs> but I do want to. Uh, I think there are many more questions, and uh, indeed, the question of the sorry. future of statistics may require an, another future forward session to think about uh, rather than the two minutes uh, between us and the coffee break. I want to thank all the three presenters for their excellent work, really showing us uh, the benefits of big data and uh, artificial intelligence in terms of timeliness and in terms of providing a new perspective on the public good that statistics really is, but also pointing out the challenges and the many things we still have to think about in next sessions and in the coffee break. Many thanks.